Risk Management and Trading Conference 2022. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenos días. Yo soy Susana Sáenz y me da muchísimo gusto darles la bienvenida a este panel en esta nueva edición de Risk Management and Trading Conference 2022. Welcome to the future of trading platforms, the retail insurrection. Good morning to everyone. We have a lot to talk about. I read that the global online, online trading platform market is projected to grow from 8 billion in 2021 to 12 billion in 2028. So I would like to start with Alejandro Faesi. Good morning, Alejandro, welcome. Well, good morning, everyone, now that I see you uh, here. Uh, Alejandro, how do you see the current trends of the new ways of trade? We cannot hear you, sí. Alejandro. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. So I was asking you, how do you see the current trends of the new ways of trade? Alejandro? ¿Se escucha? ¿Escuchan? No, yo no escucho aquí. that we were for since the pandemic uh, like taking an uh, uh, operate run a bank out of the house right right off in home office not in the building from one day to the other which which was something unthinkable before but we were forced to do it and and it worked and actually it worked a lot better than than uh, everybody uh, was expecting uh, to be honest i mean in general in the financial industry in particular. So this changed uh, the, the way uh, things are, are done and for uh, and, and most of all, the projects for the future are now are, uh, seen in a different way since the technology made available uh, uh, the, the, the interaction to be different with the clients uh, in all the process since opening an account to how they trade, to how they interact, the, the, the security within the systems how, with authenticators in the cell phones, with tokens, etc. So everything was changed pretty dramatically. And I think the market adjusts very fast to it. But there is, there is also one important thing that I think a bit of bubbles were created in the process. No? So some things were overstated, were overdone. Uh, valuations were probably also a bit overdone. And we can see that in, 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 in a lot of, of, of uh, special uh, stocks that we would like to pick representing the, the industry. And in, in that sense, uh, if we were doing this same uh, panel one year ago, when the valuation, you know, at the end of last year, when mm -hmm. the valuation was a lot higher, uh, all this would sound probably a bit different and, and probably it was too optimistic. Now we got with this recession or not coming from the inflation, rising the, the rates, central banks, tightening the monetary conditions, etc. So, of course, all the, all the assets adjust, the valuations are different now. And some bubbles were created in the middle regarding these trading platforms. So I think it's, it's interesting to see where is the real value in, in this technology that was created and what was just a fashion, a, a thing that was probably, you know, something that, that came with the new normal life uh, after, after the pandemic. And what is really there that will will uh, remain for for a permanent for the future? And I think it's a bit of both. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to stop there to 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 hear my my colleagues as well uh, talk. 
Uh, yes. So back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. And in a moment, we're going to talk about more about the bubbles and the valuations. But first of all, I would like to talk about uh, this democratization that we we are going to talk about with the new trends of trade in the markets. So, Jorge, these trading platforms, do you think really offer financial democratization? I think there might be limits. There might be uh, too much. So first of all, I kind of will give like an upfront comment, which is like my point of view is totally US centric. I don't know how these platforms work in other places. Uh, I'm actually a user myself of some of these platforms. I've been working on the buy side for some years. So that has led me to form some view of how to manage portfolios. And that view might disagree or agree with some of what is my understanding the current offering of the of the trading platforms mm -hmm. so one should have in mind like sometimes they they put this flag of we are looking for financial democratization and financial um, freedom by that what i understand is that well you would like to retire more we are talking about long-term investing However, these platforms make it quite easy to send trades. So that could that could lead to some excessive turnover, which is not really consistent with long-term investing. So I'll start by kind of like celebrating and taking my hat off of what can be done today with these platforms, which is you can take your phone, do a couple of clicks, you get access to uh, let's say the S&P 500 portfolio. It can, it doesn't get any easier than that, and that should be kind of celebrated. It's not only trading platforms; it's also technology. It's the market makers, it's the large asset managers, the ETF providers. So there's a lot of things happening, and for this, you kind of need a little bit of historical context. I feel like the new generations do not appreciate. If you want to do this, you want to buy the S&P 20 years ago. Good luck trying to do that. Mm -hmm. The ability to do it by phone is convenient, but more importantly, having the exposure is what I value the most. So then, yes, you do have democratization, but it's like with big response, it, it, it becomes a big responsibility. Where do you stop? Do you really need to be trading single stocks and trading a lot? Not necessarily. I agree, it's a big responsibility, and also we're going to talk about um, about the financial education that has to do with this. Thank you, Jorge. And Mark, in, in this uh, digitalization context, do you think also enables derivative sales, for example, and market making desks to be more price competitive and gain market share? Yeah, I, I think I second what Alejandro uh, mentioned in the introduction. I think it's mm -hmm. remarkable and fascinating at the same time to see how retail banking is influencing capital markets in particular. Uh, you call the panel insurrection. So I'll mention mostly three aspects of this overreaching influence. The first one is really related to the trader's user experience of their IT applications, where they expect similar ease of use that they have in their daily lives. That's what Jorge mentioned a second ago. The second aspect is really related to digital assets that uh, are being extended quite massively to institutional investors, uh, irrespective of the current level of the market. And the third one is what you're referring to is a digitalization of OTC derivatives market as a whole. And so if I focus on that, I think one key aspect we've seen, um, we at Murex, we work a lot with leading banks in Mexico, in Colombia, in Chile, among other countries. And we help them improve their capital markets technology experience. And we've seen an influence really of retail over this capital market. So if you look over the past couple of years or so, one of the main challenges these banks uh, needed to cope with, especially in Latin America, was related to a more proactive management of their credit risk and in particular of XVA. So all the adjustments related to funding and counterparty credit risk mainly. And that led to really the establishment of more advanced central XVA desk within this organization. And so essentially you had two reasons for that. One was that a few global banks challenged domestic players with more competitive, aggressive prices. And so a number of local banks have lost their market share. The second one is really that the XVA desk within this organization uh, were 
for the past, I would say, 10 years before being perceived as a pure credit tax, a pure credit charge. And now these exit desks are managing a key risk uh, for the banks. And so there are new needs, new policies internally that have emerged and specific fund transfer pricing practices that, uh, that took place. So that's a big shift we've seen. And so what we've been doing from a technology perspective at Murak is really to improve the technology to have better collaboration between the sales desk, between the market making or the trading desk and uh, this uh, XVA desk. So that's one example of automation that you can look forward to in the uh, next uh, the next few years to improve really the, the, the trading platforms. Okay, and Rafael, what can you tell us about the new usability of Home Broker, Home Broker point, uh, point o, uh, in this context? Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be in this panel. So, in my opinion, we are in a really interesting uh, phase of the markets. Where we've been developing many, many types, many new projects uh, for, for the retail user, for the final investors. So, our mission today is bring all the features, all the data, all the information that the investor needs and yes, for the final investor be competitive Look. with the professional one. So, uh, uh, we, we, for example, the new uh, usability that we have in the home brokers, uh, we, uh, we try to, to connect the news, the analysis, uh, the data, and, and bring together the puzzle of the markets and, and uh, using the technology, uh, explaining to the retail what, what it means. So uh, uh, we are doing many projects, even in the back office, mid office, for example, the reporters, the guys who, who writes the analysis, putting tags that you can connect with a chart or you can connect with alarm. So you have many new features that have been developing, helping the final investors have the power to, to, to make money, to, to have a great portfolio, to balance their portfolio with the the risk that the the, the the investors can take, so I think we are we are in a new phase of the new home brokers, uh, uh, connecting the new usability with the new technology and bringing the the real information that the retail needs to get the best ideas for trading and using the, these platforms for real real making money, creating a, a good portfolio not just having the connectivity, not just having the access of the market. I, th I think this phase is done and now it's bringing the tools, br bringing the features for the investors ha having really a good portfolio. Of course, the interest of everyone is to make more money, right? Well, uh, uh, so in this retail insurrection with these new platforms of trade, Alejandro, what are the implications liquidity-wise regarding meme stocks, meme stocks, uh, and does this translate to an unstable capital pool in equity markets, for example? Yes, yes, that's very interesting that, that the, all the phenomenon around the meme stocks it's a very good example about the the word retail, right? That it's 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 on, on the front line of, of our panel. The word retail, which means that uh, oh, it, it, of course it's been retail uh, all, all along, but right now the retail take take a new approach since the minimum uh, to invest because of technology pretty much came down to almost zero. No, so before you needed. Uh, to have a bit more of, of, of uh, an investment background to be able to invest in, 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 in stocks in general or in, in, in assets that are not plain vanilla. And now with this technology, you can do it from your phone with, for almost uh, no, no, uh, no minimum amount. So the, well, well, this, this sounds pretty good. All this sounds like good, but the, the backside of that is that uh, there are probably people that are trading things that they don't really know well what they are doing. They are learning and uh, this happened at very young ages. I, I think that the investors below 25 years old, for example, grew exponentially during the pandemic 
and that it's a good that it's uh, uh, again a good point a good news it's good news but uh the thing is it, there's there's uh, need to be some education behind the retail investor uh because technology now gives you an open door to something that you're probably not very familiar with so this exact uh, the, uh, topic of the meme stocks that you mentioned susana it's one example of that when the, 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 suddenly the volatility in some stocks that were in the social media were from zero to to the sky and then back to zero almost etc all that that is not healthy in a, in, a, in a market because the volatility wasn't happening because of news related to the company or to the economy in general but it was more of a social phenomenon so that i think was a lesson learned uh, and i think uh, that will will change in the future after these meme stocks uh, just brought out to the light let's say you know uh, so i think meme stocks to call it uh, that way will will be less in the future uh, i think i think it was something that was temporary and, and and we will be back to have more educated investors so the volatility will be uh, more natural to what is happening in the market and not a social phenomenon no? Raphael, what do you think about that? Do you think meme stocks are temporary? Uh, I think it's uh, uh, it's a good uh, it's a good example. No, the volatility uh, of the markets uh, it's been huge. And for example, if you take the crypto, uh, the crypto it's uh, that young people like to trade. So. I think if you help the, the investor understanding this this volatility and and uh, showing uh, features that he can trade that, that kind of volatility and he can uh, uh, put l low volatility with another uh, instrument. So helping again teaching uh, uh, the investors and putting the correct tools. Uh, uh, you can help the retail understanding and not get in, uh, get an exit from from the markets when the volatility it's it's higher. So in my opinion, it's a it's a construction of uh, uh, of the environment of the new retail. Thank you, Rafael. Jorge, which is your opinion, and also what are the risks and benefits of trading in these new platforms? Well, taking back the meme stock theme, uh, it was a really hard, uh, for some funds, it was really hard lesson uh, to learn on the buy side. So much that it is now uh, a risk factor that uh, asset managers have to monitor. So it's too early to say it's an alpha factor, but it's, it is a risk factor. Meaning, if there's a large asset manager, a large, a large hedge fund, that require that now you will have some computer scientists doing web scraping on Wall Street best and, st and things like that to see which stock are they talking about. And if they are talking about XYZ stock, maybe you don't want to be in that. You want to mitigate that exposure. You don't know it's going to go a lot higher, a lot lower, but it's just a risk factor that you have to control now. It is It was obviously not in the risk model before the the against of saga because okay. no one saw it coming but now it has to be there and then that was kind of on the BMS stock now changing a little bit gears to towards your your question first of all i find it fascinating i feel like we have two sides uh, with the panelists everyone coming from different backgrounds which um, might be like different views which i just find uh, exciting so about the the benefits and education so uh, i feel some so i first phrase like the the trading platform so like saying the good things and then I can say the things that I kind of not not fully agree I feel like uh, they talk uh, there's a mismatch between what they some of the trading platforms say and, and do so I hear a lot about the platform saying oh you should be risk aware take care about about risk you also should be like uh, avoiding uh, doing stuff that is not additive meaning behavioral finance stuff so that sounds great. I sometimes feel it's like boilerplate or cookie cutter slogans. I go to my trading platform today. I don't see anything about risk. Okay. So why, if, if the senior management is or, or or the slogans of this trading platform are talking about risk, 
So how come I open my 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 what my my screen and I don't see anything about Grace? Again, I'm talking about some of the US platforms. I need to do a lot of clicks to get something about risk. And frankly speaking, it's not that useful. <coughs> so why is that? Like if you go to the platforms, they are very good to telling you, hey, you can trade um, single stocks, ETFs, regular ETFs, lever ETFs, inverse lever ETFs, you can short, you can get bonds, commodities. So you give me all these flavors of investment and you give me nothing about risk. And you give me at most an exposed measure. So that is just like, um, that is just a mismatch between saying that you have to be risk aware. Well, give me the tools so that I can do a better job. What can you tell us about this, Mark? About these MEM stocks, MEM stocks? Well, um, I'm just going to piggyback, I think, on what Jorge said uh, at the end around risk management uh, beyond Memstock. I think it's absolutely fundamental that uh, we go through that process of education. I mean, at Mirex, we are a pure risk management system. So we've been working with banks for, for more than 30 years, and all we do is about providing them with a clear view of what the risk is, where it lies, the worst scenarios. and. I think the market is only going to be even more complex, even on the latest uh, or newest, I would say, asset classes. So um, if you look at the crypto market as an example, it's really developed as a separate asset class due to market conditions, but also due to market infrastructure, which has it quite apart from the other asset classes. And so I'm just going to share an anecdote with you, Susanna. We ran exciting R&D with one of our uh, banking clients uh, in, uh, in North America, in the US. Mm -hmm. And we studied the ability, for instance, to issue structured notes linked to crypto performance, where the underlying essentially behaves like a bond, but the payoff is dependent on the performance related to cryptocurrency. And so besides investing on pure outright underlying or of your funds, one of the ways an investor can get exposure to crypto today is via structured notes, essentially, even though they are not very liquid uh, as, as of today. Why they would do that? Essentially, it gives them a steady stream of coupon payments, uh, depending on the payoff and also to the exposure of, of the crypto. And so the typical investor you would have for such much more complex structures essentially are uh, very high net worth investors or, th or some asset managers. Some of the payoffs, for instance, we worked with with these banks were uh, capital guaranteed notes or yield enhancement notes, uh, such, such as a uh, reverse convertible or auto calls. And these are products that are fundamentally much more complex than the cash product or the listed derivatives that a number of participants today have access to. So where I see the market going is the with the ability for technology providers, trading platforms to not only give market access, market depth, but also provide the risk management tools to manage not only cash products, but also the upcoming derivatives that are bound to happen should that market really evolve into something uh, more advanced, I would say, than it's been for, for the past few, few years. Okay, so now that you mentioned uh, crypto, Mark, which are your perspectives in crypto markets, Alejandro? Well, that, that, that's a topic that it's, it's uh, quite, quite uh, also in fashion and it's evolving in ways that uh, I think we're just beginning in, in that. Uh, I think for now, uh, it came all to the, to the point that it's an asset that, uh, you know, can, can double the price in a few days. So people want to see what is that about. But what is really behind it, the technology behind it, the blockchain technology, is really what it's, it's, it's the, the fundamental uh, key for me. The, 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 not so much the currencies themselves, the cryptocurrencies, but the technology behind it that can be used in a lot of different ways, not only for, for, for that, for, for crypto. So uh, for now, it's, it's just in, in, in a development stage. Uh, not the currencies, but all the other aspects of, of them. So uh, would be is changing already and will change how the technology is built within the financial system for good, I think. No? But uh, what, uh, talking about the asset itself, uh, about the currencies themselves, the cryptocurrencies uh, themselves, uh, it, it's, it's uh, the volatility, what is behind them or not, what is the fair value or not. All that it's it's uh, very controversial controversial so i wouldn't uh, want to go uh, discussing that 
but uh, I, I am, I am uh, hopeful that the technology behind it will be and will change uh, a lot of other aspects of the financial industry. Of course. What do you think, Rafael, with all these options of investments, which are your recommendations according to the suitability of the investor? Uh, do you think, well, it's a controversial uh, coin, digital coin, crypto? I think it's m one more instrument for, for the portfolio of the final investor. No, uh, for example, I, I believe that the professional investors can help, the, for example, the brokers the sell side can, can help the the final investor, the retail investor. So uh, building good portfolios and the retail being able to follow them. With, mm -hmm. uh, that's what we've been doing, for example, in many ho new home brokers. Uh, so imagine that you build a portfolio that you have 1% in, in digital currency. What's the problem? It's an instrument that you are put in a little bit of your money over there. I don't see problem. I see that there is no correlation between equities, fixed income. So it's good. It's a diversification. That's that. That's okay. I, I don't believe that you trade in 100% of your, your money in digital <laughs> currencies. It's safe. So that that's the, well, uh, uh, where I see that the sell side, it's so much important in building the this retail uh, community uh, another example uh, that we've been doing for example imagine that you want to follow the warren buffett portfolio mm -hmm. so you put the the warren buffett portfolio with one click uh, the retail can invest and after that the uh, uh, the systems can balance this portfolio following the same percentage uh, and if they move some equities the, the system can can do the same. So again, I think the the risk uh, 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 it can be controlled by the sell side if you bring the correct tools, the correct portfolio. So this connectivity, I think it's the new phase of the the, the retail. Do you agree with this, Jorge? I agree that the retail needs more uh, risk assessment. Okay. I, I think as of today, and what I, in what I see on the current trading platforms in the U.S. that I use, is still not giving what, at least not to my standards, uh, what I'm expecting, right? Because of the reasons I mentioned, you give me a lot of in different investment vehicles, and then you give me a measure of exposed risk, which is not useful for on a going forward basis. Meaning if you want analogies, like sending someone to the war with a butter knife, like I, I, I don't feel ready. Especially I feel concerned because I, I, I mean, I, I want to think myself I'm above average investor, but mm -hmm. if I talk to my, to my manager, which does not do investing for, for living, then I feel they are even uh, in a war situation. So I, I do agree that the market needs more of this. Uh, I, I, I think the trading platform is just not there yet. So risk is the, the first thing, well, two things that are paramount in my view, which is risk, and the other one is behavioral finance. So when, th when thinking about the um, trading platforms, let's say Robinhood, where do they make money? Well, they it be for the so-called paid for the flow, meaning they benefit if there's a lot of trade. Now there's a ton of evidence, academic research, that shows that the, typical, the average retail investor does not benefit from mm -hmm. trading a lot. So there's there's a conflict there, mm -hmm. and I I think this or, or some of the trading platform they they actually they say these things. Oh yeah, don't trade a lot. That's not good. But still, it's not clear to me that from going to that message to action is is something happening. So let's say someone goes to the webinar and they say yeah, don't trade a lot, mm -hmm. and then you are, go out of the webinar and then you you put a trade. And then you say, well, they trade, told me to do not trade a lot, but is this trading a lot? How do I measure if this was trading a lot or no? So, as I mentioned before, they talk about risk and turnover, yet they don't show it. Like you go to the platforms and it's not there. So I would like to see what, okay, what's my turnover? Even better, like, can you show me how much do I trade relative to a comparable cohort? Maybe people from my age, 
something like that. So there are a lot of things that I'm hoping I can see in the future that I don't see there that are there yet. Okay. Well, and yeah, all of you... I, I, ah, yeah, so, go ahead. Sorry, Susanne, if I may interrupt for a second there. No. Uh, I think, I think uh, what Jorge was saying, uh, I, I agree. Uh, also, there is a, a, not only regarding risk, but in general regulation, I think needs also to evolve to this new instrument. That is not that new anymore. It's been around uh, a few years now. I'm talking about cryptocurrencies. Uh, th there will be a lot of new things coming from, again, the, this technology in the future. But for now, the, the crypto are not new anymore. But the regulation, I think, it's a bit lagging behind. I think, I think authorities are a bit perplexed about this, how, how they behave, how can they regulate uh, these this, uh, new, new currencies. And uh, I think it's a challenge for, for regulators. And uh, I think, I imagine in 10, 20 years from now, because regulation can take a lot, right? Out of the 2008 uh, mortgage crisis that we all know, of course, uh, the, the regulations that come because of that take a lot of years, take five six seven years and it was a pretty in in in, a, in, a, in the us not in an emerging country so it's a, on a big economy the biggest economy uh it was from mortgages it, it has to do with the financial system so it was very sensitive so and, and uh, you know adding all this the regulation was not there the next year right it took several years so uh now taking that into crypto uh, I think it would take, uh, and it has already taken a lot of years. And uh, so I would expect not to happen soon, but in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now, the market and the regulations will be more in line, more mature. So I think there's a lag in there that will eventually be filled. And, uh, and, and it's challenging and interesting to, to see what happens on that side. Of course. I'd like to comment on that, uh, if yeah, possible, of course, Mark. too. Um, I, I don't want to really, uh, I'm not going to comment on or speculate, I would say, on the future levels of crypto. I think its price move primarily reflects the kind of a speculative bet on whether or not it will one day really have a core place in the financial system. But I think an industry interesting indication is indeed retail has been trading uh, crypto for so many years already but despite the recent steep falls of the main cryptocurrencies i think we have about like a 60 percent fall from its all-time high uh, just as of last week you still have a move by institutional investors towards that i think blackrock mentioned a couple of weeks back that they had a substantial interest from their institutional clients uh, we've seen uh, Coinbase, as an example, developing a spe specific offering for institutional last year. So we see uh, some more traction. And I think with this traction, you'll get more regulations. They will put pressure on the regulators. Uh, I'm based in New York. We've seen uh, a number of conferences already where uh, most of the actors on the sell side in particular are putting pressure to have a more clear definition of the regulation. So I think that's one aspect where you'll see uh, an impact on, on trading uh, these assets and better risk management tools as, as we go along. Now, having said that, you have a second aspect we've not talked about yet, I think is really related to the side effects of these new asset classes. And I think that's quite exciting. If you look at uh, the existing systems today for many asset classes, you have FCMs, you have prime brokers, you have clearing brokers, and they manage intermediation between clients and clients and exchanges, right? And they've been doing that for so many years on so many asset classes. But now this new technology underpinning these uh, cryptocurrencies in particular, or more generally digital assets, actually are disrupting completely this model where we are now talking actually having a centralized model, model sorry, managed directly by the exchange that might disrupt completely all the intermediary you have with the brokers. And that might disrupt the market for trading fixed income portfolio, rights portfolio, equity portfolios. And I think that's something that's gonna happen that will be quite interesting whether crypto is going to be successful or not uh, in, in the years to come. Okay, uh, well, and also um, very interesting what you talked about crypto and everyone has mentioned education, the importance of the retail investor education. Alejandro, um, what do we have to do to create um, education that cross borders, that also uh, that we can reach what books cannot, are not capable to reach? 
Yes, uh, that, that, that's a very, a very interesting uh, question about education, how to, to educate retail investors, uh, because it comes down to young investors. No? I, think, I think that's the, the new retail investors are mostly uh, younger than than the average, let's say. No, mm -hmm. so uh, the, the 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 ones that are uh, you know t taking advantage of the technology and, and 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 building portfolios, even though in absolute terms they are small, but uh, when you add you know millions of these investors, then the meme stocks come about. No, so mm -hmm. they, they can move market. No, even though they are tiny tiny investors, uh, still still. Uh, they can the, uh, affect the market. So how to educate this? I think it has to come right out of college, uh, actually. Uh, not, not as a professional education, not probably in the financial industry to educate their investors, uh, because some of them, some of these investors, uh, you know, n never actually speak to, to, to somebody in, 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 in their in their platform, in their company where they are trading, because everything is digital, right? Everything is on the phone. Uh, so they, they just need to, to, to push a few buttons and they are trading. So to educate them uh, would be probably, uh, as I imagine, because it's already there, the technology, and it's, it's, uh, it's a good uh, aspect of, of it to be able to trade uh, to a wider base of clients, uh, more more than 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 before. So, because this is a good thing, I think it won't go back. I, I expect that to continue in the future. So, I I imagine the, the 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 educational system. So, going back again to high schools or college, uh, doing some some uh, classes that uh, didn't exist, right? And, mm -hmm. and now will be will be part and actually would be regular uh, role in 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 a, in a in a career that has to do with financial and not really that close to financial. I can imagine a, an architect or a, a doctor, a, a, you know, in uh, medicine, a, a doctor uh, having one one topic that it's called something like general investment or retail investment or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. As a, a thing that doesn't exist now, no? so I imagine, I imagine going that into the future. I, I would like to make some comment yes. on that. Can I? For, of uh, I, I think again, technology can help pretty much. Uh, I'm going to give you an example that we are building uh, today. For example, we use VAR, Rachel Sharp, Volatility, Beta, Alpha, all. Uh, uh, indicators that professional investors use but putting this kind of uh, uh, features for for the retail the, the the investor is really difficult so I, I don't think they really need to how to calculate that how to use so we are building dashboards so if you build for example a dashboard that imagine that you you buy more equity and it stays more red that you see oh it's more dangerous so things that inside our system we 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 use the this uh, uh, these tools but generating dashboards that the retail can understand so we've been building a lot of new projects on that and the feedback it's really good really positive so we are putting for example not just the rentability but mm -hmm. other other important issues that the retail can understand by building really nice dashboards, really charts, things that they can understand by colors, etc. That's great, Rafael, thank you. Jorge, what do you think about that? What can be done today? We have a big responsibility with the retail investors' education, right? Yeah, it's uh, a challenging topic. So you have this educational uh, kind of the slash uh, regulation. I, I don't have like a super clear view. I have a couple of thoughts, but I mean, I'm not like a fan of government intervention. Or, mm -hmm. however, when it comes to preventing people from engaging in reckless behavior, I kind of like uh, agree on some regulation. It's not clear who should be responsible. Is it? Is it? And you might you might ask why? Why are you talking about the government? So let's say. Uh, 
you want to prevent someone from doing reckless behavior like you don't want a 10 year old like driving so it, you want to avoid the tragedy so to speak like losing someone lifetime savings in a in a blink it is a tragedy of some form let's say you work so hard for your money and then you lose it you 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 spend some of your life and you lose that that time spent so there has to be some education and then the question to me is like well how do you standardize like i know some platform has some assessment if you want to trade options how is that different from the same assessment from the other platform? Should it be standardized across platforms? And then you go to the assessment and yourself are the one who choose the experience. So even though I might be 20 years old, I can choose that I'm an experienced trader. Who is going to validate that? And then there's, there's, there's some like things that the trading platforms are doing for good. Like it's kind of like they're uh, their risk management days themselves. So you want to put a trade today on Schwab uh, by trading GSG commodities, and it says this is highly risky, mm -hmm. extremely volatile. And the question is like, is that enough? Is that where your responsibility ends? If if a, if a teenager goes by that thing and he loses his lifetime savings, I mean, how do you feel about that? Even though you put the message there, like where, where does the responsibility stop? And I do think also that psychology has a role to play, meaning if you tell a teenager, hey, this is highly risky, not suitable for you, maybe. Okay. I mean, okay. I'm not a teenager, but I don't know how exactly I would read. I suppose like I, I start with $10,000 and you tell me, hey, there's this chance that you lose $9,000. I will probably react differently to those statements. Okay. Well, Mark, which is your overview uh, from also other perspective, other country, in terms of education of retail investors? I, I, I would say that I agree with, with Jorge. I'll take maybe a different take. Uh, I, mean, I, I know you're Jorge, you're, you're based in the, in the US too, so, so I am. And uh, I'll take an, ex an example. We hire quite a lot of a new uh, newcomer in my company out of school. Uh, to help us uh, develop the, the software for, again, primarily for capital markets. But it's a good measure to see how well the education has been working for these new type of assets. A lot of the people we actually hired are actually trading almost on a daily basis. Um, a number of these new, let's call them new assets, uh, once again, uh, like crypto. Most of them have a portfolio already. They have been having this portfolio for a few years. And that comes quite handy, actually, you know, as, as a company when we recruit this talent to have people from a younger age than probably, you know, 20 years ago when I joined myself the company to be able to be operational and understand the risks. So I understand, you know, the complexity and the responsibility. I'm not sure they're fundamentally different from what we've used to have in the different uh, asset classes. But if you take uh, again in, in, in the US or also in Canada, where we do have offices there, uh, I would say that a lot of the, the young people we hire uh, out of school are actually well versed in the availability and the risk involved uh, in these different assets. Uh, I mean, there we have games, you know, as part of that, where we're we are monitoring the portfolio levels of uh, from the different retail investors. So, so I wouldn't be too pessimistic. I would just reinforce what uh, I think Alejandro, you were saying is like, yeah, we need to uh, make sure that any people, any person accessing these markets, not only people out of school, of out of university or specific colleges, have this type of of, uh, of understanding of the of the risks. Okay, thank you, Mark. And well, Jorge, you have worked in one of the most acknowledged hedge fund, Citadel of Ken Griffin. What can you recommend to all young people that is watching us who desire and dreams are to work in a hedge fund? Well, it's, a, it's a, like a long road. Like uh, you have to decide what's the career path you want to take. And if that's the, the take, there's many, many different uh, type of hedge funds uh, to work with. But I will suggest uh, two things that have changed from, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, which is um, technology or programming. So that is now a like like the entry ticket for any any role at, at these hedge funds, which now are all of them are like heavy technology. So finance, 
did not used to be about programming. Now it is about programming. You you have to do it uh, with with the help of a computer. So that's kind of has been the the shift from 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 the last years that finance has become much more data intensive, and there is this actually merge of like financial data science. So you have data science, you have finance. So you want to work in that uh, in that field. Uh, just just make sure you you know how to go. The sooner the better. Don't do what I did. I started coding when I was like 22 years old. You want to start like maybe when you're 12 years old. Uh, that would be mm -hmm. kind of like the yeah the advice. Very young. <laughs> Which are your recommendations, Mark? Uh, well, I'm not in that space of you oh, know, know I've not been not working at Citadel, <laughs> but I would second that though um, because. It, it, no, a lot of people we hire equally work in, in banks or uh, or in hedge funds. We're, we're working with a number of hedge funds there, and I, I would I would definitely say that a lot of these companies, to a large extent, themselves define themselves as a technology uh, company. Uh, many CEO of banks have mentioned that in the past. Uh, I think you have uh, other companies on the buy side, like Bridgewaters, as an example, mentioned that many times as well. They made a fortune out of data science, like many, many years ago. And so a lot of the profiles we get uh, and the talent we get in, in hiring actually um, are not primarily, I would say, coming from a financial uh, background, but mostly data science background uh, and the technology background. A lot of them develop uh, during their personal hours too. And that's kind of a drive to be able to link uh, technology, everything they've learned there, and FinTech, which is kind of, a, I would say, a robust and uh, ever-evolving uh, industry. Okay, thanks. And Alejandro, what do you think uh, that Brazil has done well over the last 10 years in, or in order to have listed 4,000 companies? We are an important economy among um, uh, Latin America. What are we missing? Yeah, well, that has nothing to do with the retail, I guess. It's, it's mm -hmm. a different topic, but it, it has to do a lot with investors, right? Uh, yeah. I, I think it's part of a cycle. Uh, when, when, when the recession, the market is not booming, it's usual that company do that, you know, they, they, they bought their own stocks, they, they, they listed. Uh, but uh, when the market is on the other way booming, everybody wants to go into the market, there are a lot of IPOs. So I think there's a, there's a lot of correlation between the mood in the market and the, the companies uh, going public or not. Uh, so because we are in the middle of a, of, 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 of a a, a period of, of, of uh, instability, defining what will happen with inflation, what will happen with recession, if it will come or not, how hard will it hit or not, because we're in the, right in the middle of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's normal for some companies to have uh, these behaviors and the stock market to do it as well. Uh, I, I mean worldwide, right? Uh, of yeah. course, Mexico, it's probably uh, performing a bit worse than some, some other countries countries you mentioned brazil yes mm -hmm. or or some other countries uh but uh, i think i think that has to do a lot with the economic cycle as well so not so much with technology with platforms with investors that that we that the topics that we were discussing earlier but most more with the economic cycle so i think it it comes and goes a bit like a wave on the sea right on the shore so there are times when when it comes in one direction and then in in another and uh, it's very clear the direction is now no uh but but uh the point is that it's not something that it's it's uh to be to stay here to remain here but something that it's a flow no that comes and goes uh, so i would expect to reverse uh, eventually okay thank you for answering this question that we have from our audience also for rafael what actions have b3 and regulators taken in order to make Brazil stand out as the equity king in Latin America? I, I think B3 approach pretty much to, to the brokers, to the sell side. Uh, uh, the exchange help uh, bringing uh, new contracts to the exchange, uh, promoting to, to, the retail, uh, to the, the retail investors. I think the the brokers here, the sell side, did it a really great job 
on promoting the platforms, uh, different platforms, different technologies, and, uh, types of so some 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 brokers that are really specialized in fixed income, others in equities. So uh, and and again, education. Uh, we we do have many many brokers uh, that education is a business. It's not just something more. It's a, a, a case of business, and and you can have a lot of education free, uh, understanding more the markets and the regulated. It's really connected with the old environment. So the buy side, the assets, the brokers. So the regulated, it's really connected and understanding the reality of the market. So I think Brazil, it's a, a, a good case because the old environment worked well. That's okay. my opinion. Okay. Well, we are uh, getting to the final uh, lap of this panel. So I would like to conclude with every one of you of this trading insurrection, the new platforms, which challenges you see, which benefits, and which is the future of these plat plat platforms. Would you like to start, Mark? Sure. Um, I think, uh, uh, maybe I'll conclude on a positive note, I think, uh, mm -hmm. and look at what's quite exciting. We've seen disruptive markets, crypto, we, we talked quite a lot about that. That's changing the status quo for, I would say, traditional finance, whether that's market hours, access to the market, simplicity of uh, margining, collateralization. So these whether they're successful or not, they've changed the mindset of many of these uh, institutions, whether they're on the sell side or the technology providers. And we've seen, specifically, I would say for the past two years, uh, much more focus on developing solutions, technologies, trading platforms that are uh, much more efficient than they used to be, not only for the new asset classes, but for, like I said, traditional finance. And that's well I would say welcome in the sense that for about 10 years or so, most of the banks uh, were hammered completely by regulations and most of the technology budget was going through providing solutions to be regulatory compliant. That was the case for many regulations uh, with Dot Frank, with a fundamental review of the trading book uh, worldwide. That was true for uh, mandatory margining on a bilateral uh, fashion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now a lot of the budget has shifted towards investing in technology, in technology that makes it much more easier to access and risk manage a pool of asset classes. And now a lot of our clients today actually work with us, not so much with compliance in mind, but giving access to new asset classes. And all the trading platforms in the future will have to be much more flexible and scalable to introduce them. A few things we're working on, I think that to echo the previous uh, section you had, a lot of the connection we have with our clients is around trading uh, ESG, and a large one, especially in North America, is around carbon emissions. So yeah. instead of talking how we're going to comply with that, the idea is like how can we give access to uh, the different retail investors or institutional investors to these type of asset classes. And that's quite exciting and very much looking forward to it. Quite exciting. Thank you, Mark. Jorge. I apologize. I didn't get the question. Got some uh, which are your conclusions the about this trading uh, new platforms insurrection and which are the challenges and the benefits? If you can tell us this in one minute because we are running out of time. Yeah, the key message is just for the retail investor. Just think when when you wanna when you hear trade like like the pros, just think about that a little bit more. Like there are pros that spend 12 hours per day doing that, and many of them are not successful. So what are the chances that you, after your normal or regular job, spending an hour or two after that, are gonna do better than that? Just take that question to home and think about it. Okay. Thank you. Rafael? Yes, uh, again, I, I think we are in a new phase of the, uh, it's really uh, happening many projects, many interesting things. Uh, I think uh, having more products, funds, uh, bringing out, uh, I, I want a new ETF, I knew a fund that can trade uh, uh, currencies, 
bringing that correct product to the correct investor, uh, it's great. And in one click, two clicks, you can invest in, you can receive push in your mobile. So remember the retail, it's not a pro, it's not all, all day in the markets, but yes, he can follow and take uh, uh, good opportunities and build in his uh, a good portfolio with the r correct risk. So I think technology is putting all the disposal together and, and showing for everyone. So you don't need to be a, a pro to understand the markets. Technology can, can do this, this middle part. So that's where we've been working with the brokers to the assets and the final investors. So I think it's, uh, it's it, we are building a really new wave of opportunities on market. Thank you, Rafael. The last conclusion, Alejandro. Yes, thank you, Susana. Yeah, I, I think yeah, the, the, the financial industry changed with the pandemic and, and uh, because of technology, basically. No? So uh, since it's a new game and some, some things uh, are here to stay, are also some that are probably just a, a bit of a bubble, some fashion, that, that the things that are in the market trending right now, but really doesn't create value, <laughs> don't create value. So uh, I think some of these will remain and some not. Uh, the mm -hmm. time will tell which ones are, are what. But uh, I, I think I think it, it is a good thing that for sure, one thing is uh, in, in, you can invest with less, less obstacles that you did before, uh, not only technologically, but in general, uh, you, you can, there is, there is uh, an, easy, uh, an easier access to investors from all ages. So that thing uh, just creates some challenges around it, like education, like regulation, etc. that we talked about, but uh, eventually uh, will, will, be, will be built in and uh, th that's the market of the future, no? that will incorporate these things. Uh, we are starting this process, uh, just, we are just coming out of the pandemic. So in a few years from now, things will, more, will be more consolidated in a full aspect of it. No? But uh, I think this, this is one of the good things that left the pandemic, no? uh, for sure. Well, thank you very much uh, to all of you. I think it's fascinating talking about the evolution of the markets, the new platforms, and it's very important what we talked about, the education. So I hope the next years we have uh, a retail investor more educated. Thank you very much. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a Susana, Alejandro, Jorge, Mark y Rafael por esta enriquecedora discusión. Así es, siempre es un privilegio compartir el, privilegio el escenario es mío, contigo. Querido Alonso Castellot, estamos aquí en esta eh, edición de Trading Management, Risk Management and Trading Conference, en las que, bueno, creo que cada tema que viene es más interesante que el otro. Cada vez, cada vez nos envuelve más, cada vez nos lleva más lejos. Uh -huh. Y de esta manera continuaremos con los cursos y talleres de la Risk Management and Trading Conference 2022. No olviden asistir a la conferencia y mesa panel del día de hoy. Son estupendas oportunidades de actualizarse con lo último de los mejores. En punto de las 5 de la tarde retomaremos las plenarias. Igualmente no pierdan la oportunidad de conocer el área de negocios y la propuesta de valor de los patrocinadores del evento. No olviden compartir con nosotros sus experiencias en las redes sociales de Rismatics Financial con el hashtag, eh, hashtag RMTC 2022. Nos vemos en el break de las 12. En, un, en unos instantes eh, volveremos con ustedes. Muy buenas tardes.